We've been talking about uh, regression so far, and in fact, we talked a bit about logistic regression. I wanted to come back around to this type of regression and talk a little bit more formally about the mathematics that hide behind it. So just a quick review. With logistic regression, what we had was a linear model, and then we tacked on to the end a nonlinearity, and specifically a sigmoid. This sigmoid has an output range from zero to one, and this allows us to interpret the output of a network as being a probability. From the context of classification, we can then interpret this probability as being the probability of some input being in the positive class. When we did our derivation for regression, I talked in terms of the mean squared error cost function. And, and we could actually formulate this in terms of the squared differences between our ground truth label of zero or one and the probability that is actually being output from our model. This formulation does come with some problems and I wanted to talk through this mathematically. And this will allow us to then take the step into other cost functions that turn out to work much better. All right, first I want to just get our notation down here. Recall that we had this notion of some function of x input, and this is just our sum of our different input features uh, weighted by a set of w's. So that's the, the simple form. And, and then we wrapped around this linear model a nonlinearity. So let's assume that this is, say, z, and our nonlinearity was for the sigmoid looks like this. And that's our logistic function. Now for our mean squared error, then our, our mean squared error looks like this. So it's going to be a sum over all of our different examples. So there are m total examples. And I'm going to assume that we have our, our y is equal to our gz. Actually, that's y hat. So yj minus our estimate of what y should be. And since this was a, a classification problem, our, our yj's could be either 0 or 1, and then our y hats, of course, range between 0 and 1. And, and in fact, they can't be exactly equal to either one of those, just by the nature of our logistic function. In order to do gradient descent, what we need to be able to do is compute this partial derivative ded uh, w of some i. I'm going to make a, a capital uh, i there just to make it distinct from our lowercase i. And let's just work through pushing this derivative through this mean squared error equation. And for some of you, this should feel comfortable, those coming through calculus. The, the key here is that we're trying to establish at least some amount of intuition here. And we'll end up with math that, that we can point to and, and talk about that intuition. Okay, so DEDWI, first off, we can push that derivative inside of the sum. So that's just 1 over m sum j n minus 1. And we'll put the derivative inside of here. And that is with respect to our yj minus yj hat sum squared. Now to get at this derivative, this is just an application of the chain rule. And so this is equal to two times the error times the derivative of the inside. Yj hat. So this term here, that is a constant. So the derivative of a constant is just uh, zero. This term here, the next thing I'm going to do is actually uh, substitute in our full expression for y hat. And move the two on the outside. 
so in bringing in the, the full expression for yj hat, so that's that's the full component right there. Um, note that x now has two subscripts, j and i, and this is to acknowledge the fact that we have a set of different examples, whereas before I was just writing things with respect to a single example, and I've dropped that j subscript. So as we talked about, this yj is just a constant, so that will drop out of this equation. And actually, let me just do a copy of that. Just drop that right in. So here we're going to uh, apply the, the chain rule for computing this derivative here. And this is just g prime of that input. I'll write it all out here just to be pedantic, but, but as we go further, I'll probably cut that down a bit. So the derivative of this g is, is g prime times the derivative inside. And that's a sum over, over n plus one items. So the key observation here is that within this sum, there is one lowercase i that matches our uppercase i. And the remaining components are different, have different lowercase i's. Before we go any further, I need to make sure I get this negative one in here, because that has to be accounted for uh, here. Now the, the key observation within the sum is that this uh, uppercase i, that refers to exactly one of the lowercase i's. So there's one lowercase i that matches and the others do not match. For the ones that do not match, when we actually push that derivative inside of the sum, those terms, the wi, x, j, i's, are constant relative to the w big i. And because they're constant, then the derivative is actually zero. So we're gonna push that in. Okay, so, so let's go ahead and push that uh, derivative in here. And so we have a total of n plus one of these terms. As I said, one of them actually matches the w uppercase i. And in that case, the derivative is x i j. And the remaining terms, they're constant relative to the w big I. So, so the derivative here is zero. So this whole thing collapses down to one a small piece. And let's go ahead and draw that in. And that small piece is x capital I j. All right, one thing I'm going to do is go ahead and pull this negative one out of the sum, since it applies to all terms in the sum, and that makes things a little bit simpler. So what we've ended up with here is an expression that talks about how the error is going to change as we change this w big i. So that's what the meaning is of this, of this term here on the left-hand side. And what I want to do is kind of stare at what's going on on the, on the right-hand side. And in, in particular, we've got the prediction error, which is right here for the j example. We've got the value of our input feature. And then in between, we've got this g prime. And let's, let's talk a little bit of, about that. And this will be our intuition about where things can go wrong with this mean squared error derivation. So let's go ahead and draw Let's draw G first. So there's an axis. This is going to be our, our input. There's our, our zero right there. 
this axis is really that sum. So this is the, the sum over i, wi, xji. And here, this is some value. And that's going to range between 0 and 1 up here. Now, what g wants to do is at, and we've talked about the shape of this before, at 0, g is at 0.5. And then as we end up on the right-hand side over here, in the infinite limit, we actually approach 1. So we're actually sitting out around 1, or very near 1 out over here. And likewise, on the opposite side, we're, we're sitting out for very negative values we're sitting out near zero. Then, then there has to be some transition between that zero and one. And right in this vicinity here, that transition kind of has a, a locally is kind of linear, and then it tapers off. So from here, it kind of looks like this. And going to the negative side, it's uh, symmetric. And so it kind of looks like that. How I've drawn it, it's not exactly symmetric. I apologize for that. But uh, in, in reality, it is really is symmetric. So the next question we want to answer is what happens with the derivative? So this curve here, this is our g. And now we want to ask what this derivative looks like. And, and clearly, sitting out over on the right-hand side or the left-hand side here, that derivative is pretty darn close to 0 on both sides. And it, the derivative is highest right, right in this vicinity here. So I'm going to go ahead and draw this in. This is not entirely to scale, but that derivative sits about here. It turns out that the derivative of this sigmoid has a Gaussian shape, and so it, it looks something like this. And it's symmetric as well. That's not very convincingly symmetric. Try that again. So that's a little bit closer, it's not perfect. So this actually kind of cuts down a little bit more. OK, so this is g prime. And uh, for those who want to work through the math, I encourage you to go ahead and compute what that derivative actually is. But the, the point here is derivative is highest in the middle, and it is arbitrarily close to 0 on either the left or the right-hand side. So let's imagine a couple of different situations here. So let's imagine that the true value, some yj, is actually 1. And our net input sits here. And so what our corresponding yj hat, in this case, it's something close to 1. So in that case, this, this error here, that is uh, close to 0. And, and what that means is that if if I go and my, I change my corresponding wi, then I'm not actually going to change the error all that much. And, and, and this is really appropriate because we're answering this particular example very close to correct. If I answer differently, so suppose my y hat is actually sitting here, then my output is is sitting right here. So that's sitting right around 0.6 or so. So with our answer being 0.6 and the correct answer being 0.1, that means that this term here is actually something different than 0. And, and it's in to a degree that's somewhat interesting. This g prime term here, if we look that value up, we're sitting, sitting right here on that g prime curve. So that value is, is also uh, something interesting. So these two terms are interesting values. And then it all comes down to what the feature input is uh, over here. And if that feature is something that's non-zero, this particular element of the sum is actually going to contribute something that is something away from zero, which means that d, e, d, w, big I for at least this particular j is actually something interesting, a, a real uh, derivative. So making a tweak to this one w big I that, that we're considering actually has some interesting meaning. So what this means is we'll actually make progress in the training process. All right, let me clean this up a little bit.
And now let's consider a case where our y hat j is actually sitting out on this far left hand side. So the net input is quite negative and the answer from the network is that we are guessing a zero. I guess I should say when I'm drawing these w hat j's down here, what I really mean by that is the, the net input, the sum here that leads to that y hat. The y hat actually sits all along the horizontal axis. So I should make sure I'm clear about that. So in this case, the network is guessing a yj uh, that's really close to zero. And what that means for the sum here is that the truth is a one and I'm guessing a zero. So that's a, a, a big number there and that's fine. Let's assume that x big I j is actually something interesting. It's not zero as well. And so actually estimating a derivative that's something interesting, non-zero, means it hinges on this g prime being non-zero. But look at where the red curve is sitting. The red curve is also sitting at pretty arbitrarily close to zero. So in this situation, even though we have this big error, the contribution to d e d w big I is, for this particular example, is actually arbitrarily close to zero. So that means we're not actually going to, in the next step of gradient descent, we're not actually going to make a big change toward repairing this particular example. So what this tells us is this cost function that we've chosen, this mean squared error cost function, really is not a very good choice, at least with respect to this particular choice of a sigmoid function. The problem though is that anytime we constrain our output of our network to be, or our function, to be something between zero and one, there's always going to be a broad range where our derivative is going to be zero. So choosing a different G is not going to solve the problem. What the answer turns out to be is that we're going to switch up our cost function. So that'll be our next conversation.